Now that we're outside of Ableton and I've bounced what I did in Ableton, we put it in Pro Tools. What you're looking at now is the initial song idea session. We've gone over how I did the breaks. We've gone over these couple like kicks and 808s that I added and the little voices and things that are in it to sort of enhance it. Uh, but those are just the first couple of tracks. You know, when I was inside of Ableton, I added a couple Junos that was sort of taking me in the vein of where I wanted to go in terms of sounds that I wanted to put on top of it. The very first thing, and, and again, you're looking at this as a, you know, an idea session. When I put this in, I started to notice the phasing of my drum break, my kick, and my 808. This is one of the biggest concepts that I try to get across to people that when you're layering sounds, phase is completely important. It's so important that you could be adding things and actually be taking away from how hard they hit because they start to phase with each other. What is phase for people who don't know? You know, all of our wave files here have a peak and then they go into slopes. If we look here, this goes up, this goes back down. We call this a cycle, right? And if you notice, this is our kick. Its cycle is not going at the same cycle as the 808, which is not going at the same cycle as the break. My job is to sort of arrange them so that when this peak is going up, the 808 peak is going up and the break beat is going up. Of course, they're not the same size, they're not the same um, just length because they're not the same sound. So what you have to do is sort of do this by eye, but also by ear. So what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll slightly move. Now that I can see exactly where everything is, I'll move my 808 and my kick so that you can see that they're sort of hitting at the same place. That wasn't originally the way, they were off a little bit. So I had to just sort of slide them over. Let me make these tracks a little smaller so you can see what I'm talking about. So if I mute everything and I just have this, and I zoom in just on different parts, you'll see that they're not always perfectly even. But what I'm trying to do is have a range as to where the hit of the 808 and the hit of the kick is coming at the exact same time as the hit of the breakbeat. And that's just me scooting things around. If I need to go in and chop per kick and move them around, my breakbeat is the thing that has the feel, the human feel in it. It's the thing that I'm trying to emulate. So I will take the time to chop every single kick. Most of the time it's not needed because I've thought about that as I'm programming, but now that I have it in Pro Tools, why not? If, if I have the ability to do it, you know, no one cares how long a song took to make. No one cares how long a beat took to make. All they do is they listen to the song. So however long this takes you, you know, this is the point where I start to get things right. That's probably the first thing that I do once I get it inside of Pro Tools. And then I end up sending this to Volley. And Volley will sit at home and construct a song around the beat that I have. And one of the reasons that I wanted to show you this is because more than what you put in, it's what you keep out. What we do is we try to throw everything in the kitchen sink in all at once. This is me watching my favorite groups, like a De La Soul or something like that, where there was all these little parts that come in, but they all contribute to the record. So I add a bunch of things, but I also edit myself. I take out a bunch of things. So as you'll notice, just these voices, you know, they start here. They were running through the whole thing. You'll get to a point over here where there was a decision to mute them for the second half, right? Then I start layering it and I added this Juno, right? This basic sound. You can tell that's me playing, right? Because it's not the most complicated chord, you know, sort of thing. It's me just with rhythm and dun, dun, dun. it's me going along with the sample. So I'm trying to add textures that go along with this. Another thing that I do, I just turned it up so you could hear it. But another thing that I do is I try to balance it so that whatever I'm adding as an instrument feels like I was there the day that they made the original song. I don't want it too loud so that it's hovering over top of the sample and I obviously don't want it too low that you can't feel it. Some things are just feel things that should be underneath, but me, I like to get a, a perfect blend. This is the way I do my live shows. This is the way I do a lot of stuff that has samples in it 
and I'm layering and adding things on top. If there's too much over top of the sample, it, you start to lose this feel of why you chose that in the first place. So leveling has a lot to do with it. Right? You'll notice in that next part, the Juno comes out just for a little bit, comes back in, because you'll find out later on that this is all the hook part. So then there's a change when it goes from just this hook part. Another Juno. And again, you can tell this is me playing, it's not complicated, I'm literally just following, you know, the notes that are in the sample. It's very simple, but it adds on and gives us a new section. Now, when I actually did this, I just layer things. I know that I'm going to mute them. I'm going to figure out what it is. But at the time that I'm doing this, again, no song exists. I have no idea what the song is going to be about. I don't know what whatever Volley is going to do. This is just me giving bits and pieces so that we have things to choose from. The reason I'm bringing that up is because I may add something in the process of me making the beat and then never use it. So this Juno 3, as you can see, was muted throughout the whole track. It's literally me copying that same MIDI to another channel and getting a different flavor out of my Juno. So it's the same MIDI, but a different Juno patch. And I was trying to give myself different sound palettes, but obviously at the end of this, we ended up not even using it. But again, I'm just giving you an idea of my process. The more I put in, the more you know flavor we have to play with, the more uh, Volley has you know space to write around, the more things he can do. You know, Volley's very good at arranging a song. Not only does he come up with the idea, you know, I'll email him this beat in Pro Tools so that he can start writing. And when I first hear it back, it sounds like this. It's it's him coming in and going, okay. So just that intro part shows you exactly what I mean about arrangement. It's still those same parts, but you don't get the drums yet. You don't get the kick yet. The 808 only comes in after those first four bars. The loop is what really starts the whole thing. We don't hear the voices until the scream, which is sort of now playing off the end of his hook. Again, this is how songs are created. This is how you say, okay, well, this was the vibe he set, and this is what, what we're gonna do. So that's sort of how this gets built. Right, that's pretty much the hook. Now we're starting to formulate an idea. You know, our group and the reason that we call ourselves coup d'etat is that we were like, okay, we were gonna call it coup de gras, but then, you know, we were like, well, coup d'etat is a little bit more intense. It's, it's about, you know, a small group of people taking over, you know, a government or overthrowing a king or any of those things. And that's sort of the feel of who we are, which is why this song sort of represents us as a group. And it was probably like one of the best first songs that we ever made. I also have this great production partner who completely understands his voice. As I'm giving him this music, he's giving me vocals back already with textures and things already on them. Roll out, burn the city to the fucking ground. Showdown, 
Tell your mayor this is not your town. Seven.